All there, right. Yeah. What's there, up, Pete? What's up? Well, for one thing, the, the cold wind is blowing off the Hudson River, which is off to my right here. So that's why I'm kind of buttoned up today. Um, it's a little chilly over there, huh? Yeah. I mean, global warming has happened and it's been warm most of the winter, but the cold winds blew today. So maybe right. a little more uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed. <laughs> That's good. It'll, it'll wake you up a little bit that stimulate your, your brain here. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Well, man, yeah, thanks, Pete, for being on the show. This is, you know, I'm pretty excited to talk. You got a, a fun, interesting subject that you've tackled here uh, in your book, which I'll let you you pronounce because I think I'm going to mess it up. Well, um, the book is called In Vino Duplicitas, uh, The Rise and Fall of a Wine Forger Extraordinaire. And that's a play on In Vino um, Veritas, in wine, there is truth. And I must say, my own daughter said, uh, Dad, why did you call it in vino duplicitas? And I said, well, Kate, you know in vino veritas, right? And she said, uh, no. So I realized, <laughs> OK, well, if you don't know in vino veritas is an old saying, then it's not going to quite make sense. But it means in wine, there is duplicity as opposed to truth. And that's the theme of the book. Okay, nice. That's good. I didn't realize that. I, I love that because I uh, got to admit, I, I wasn't familiar with that, with that saying either. You know, wine is tricky and that's part of its fascination for people who, who are obsessive about wine or even are just loving wine. Uh, it, the wine in your glass whispers to, to you in a different way from the way it whispers to somebody else. And it might whisper to you one way today and another way tonight. And depending on the weather, depending on your mood, wine is always changing. You know, if you buy a bottle of Coke or a bottle of Budweiser, a can of Budweiser, it's going to be the same each time. You expect it to be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you, Travis, I've been drinking wine now for, I like to say, tasting wine for 50 years because I'm not a big drinker. I'm a... I, People say, oh, Peter, you love to drink wine. I say, well, I love to taste wine. Uh, my capacity isn't that large. So um, so anyway, uh, each time you taste, it's going to be a little different depending on your mood. And uh, that's, the, that's there's no other beverage quite like that. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're, you consider yourself more of a wine taster, is that... Like, does that mean that you just don't drink a lot of it? Or are you really doing the, like, the tasting it and then spitting it out? Well, certainly, uh, I live in New York, and there are wine tastings probably every day of the week here. You know, sometimes multiple tastings. And if you're in this wine world, uh, and I don't consider myself a wine critic. I, I think of myself as a wine uh, journalist and reporter. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the human side of wine, winemakers, the dramas in wine. Uh, critics are, are another another kettle of fish, so to speak. And uh, I, I don't feel I have those tasting chops that, that you really need to say, oh, there's a little bit of mulberry here and a little black raspberry there and a little bit of granite somewhere else. You know, that's not my thing. I respect people who have those extraordinary abilities to describe wines in certain ways but that's not not me i'm a, i'm a wine journalist mm -hmm. so your question come back to the question if i can still remember uh uh i i don't have you know maybe it's my one one thirty second american indian uh mohawk indian so i don't have a whole lot of uh, tolerance for fire water as my father used to call it uh so uh if my wife and i open a bottle of wine with luck, we'll drink a third of it on a weekday night um, and a third the next night. And then the third night, it'll be gone. But uh, in general, you know, I know people who will put away two bottles, you know, on a weekday night and it has no effect on them. It would it would on me. How about mm -hmm. you? I'm just curious, Travis. Are you uh, what's your position on on wine consumption? Could I put you I'll on the. Yeah, no, I'm I'm probably more I'm I'm a closer to your side, I'd say. I'm not really a big drinker, but yeah, if I 
it's usually like one or two beers is all I have when I go out or, or just like a glass of wine or so, you know. Do you like a glass of wine with dinner? Uh, you know, I haven't for, but in the past maybe year or so, I've started to kind of get more into it and, and uh, everything like that. My uncles have started showing me the, the way on that. Leading you down the path of evil. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I grew up in just uh, my dad and my other uncle were just Coors Light drinkers all the time. So that's what I grew up with, you know, and started with just drinking beer. But now we're we're expanding the the knowledge a bit, I guess. Well, there are times for it and times not. You know, if you go into a Mexican restaurant, beer is is the drink of the day for sure. And, exactly. Uh, you go into a French bistro, well, then then you better look at the wine list. Um, right. <laughs> exactly, uh, yeah. So Very, very uh, true. I think I've kind of led you a little um, off topic here. Uh, shall we talk a little bit about wine and this, and this I've written and the villain, the charming villain in this book, uh, whose name yes. is really Rudy one. Yes. How do you pronounce his last name? What is it? Uh, Kurniawan. It's uh, he is of um, Indonesian nationality, uh-huh. and uh, we'll get to that. But um, his ethnicity is Chinese, and uh, well, I'll go ahead and say this: um, often the Chinese have not been. Um, uh, what shall I say? There's not been a lot of affection for the Chinese in Indonesia. Uh, by on the on the part of the we'll call them native Indonesians, Muslim Indonesians, for various reasons. But anyway, the 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 result is that when a child is born, an infant is born uh, of Chinese ethnicity, uh, it often happens that he gets both a Chinese name and an Indonesian name, and the name Rudy Kurniawan which is the Indonesian name, is actually, as I learned, the name of a champion badminton player in, uh, in Indonesia back in the 60s. Oh. So I guess it's I gave him a Chinese name. I can't even quite pronounce to this day his Chinese name. But his parents said, hey, let's name him after that great badminton player. And so right. he does have an, a, a much uh, admired uh, name of, of, of somebody from that world. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Cool. Yeah. So let's get into the story. Um, I mean, would perhaps you know best, but would a good place to start kind of be on why wine is kind of open to forgery in the first place? That's a very good place to start, and it's the right place to start. It took me a while to to uh, to think about why counterfeiting wine. Uh, can be such a good um, crooked career, shall we say. Um, If you uh, buy a Rolex watch at a good price, and you're not quite sure if it's really a true uh, authentic Rolex, you can take it into a jeweler. He'll pop the the lid off the back, and he can tell you in a minute whether that's a real Rolex or not. Uh, If you buy a Hermes scarf for two or three hundred dollars, uh, says Hermes in the corner. But if you take it into a, an Hermes uh, boutique, somebody there will tell you in a minute if it's a if it's a real Hermes scarf with the handbags and so on. Um, mm-hmm. lot luxury products can be knocked off and then detected. Uh, mm-hmm. Wine is imprisoned in the bottle so that. You know, there's a cork, there's a foil, it's in there, you know it's in there, but until you taste it, you don't really have an accurate way of knowing if it's real and or whether that label on the bottle is fake uh, or whether it's a real bottle which has been refilled with some some other inferior wine and then right. carefully and put the capsule on. Uh, I mean, you can you can work hard to, as Rudy did to make beautiful fake labels and stamp corks and make a capsule and do all those things so that even experts would look at his bottles and say, hey, that's a real bottle when it really wasn't. Or you could uh, buy an expensive bottle, drink it, enjoy it 
and then, as I say, carefully um, uh, take the cork out so it isn't it hasn't been destroyed. Uh, take the capsule off the top so it can be slipped back on, and then you refill it with a little. Uh, what shall I say, Robert Mondavi? Uh, you know, reserve or something or some whatever you want, and then refit everything back on the bottle. And it's a true bottle. And again, how do you know if it's the real wine or not unless you uncork it? But once you do that, it basically you you've destroyed you've in order to learn if the wine is real, you've destroyed it. That's part one. Part two is even then, wine is just tricky. You can never be sure. And the experts uh, have often been tricked. And, and, and as we'll talk about, Rudy Kurniawan was pretty good at tricking them. So mm -hmm. anyway, come back to the answer to your question. Wine is really the ideal uh, uh, object to forge. Now, if you, if you could only get 20 or 30 bucks for a bottle, well, in the old days, you know, it wasn't so long ago, 1990s, that was about it. The very best bottles, yeah, you could get a few hundred dollars by, I would say, the year 2000, 2001. The most desirable bottles of French wine, in particular, uh, Bordeaux and Burgundy, they were all they were up going up past a thousand dollars a bottle, past two thousand dollars a bottle, three thousand dollars a bottle, even as high as ten thousand dollars a bottle. So, hey, you know. It might be worth, uh, you know, tricking out a bottle uh, and, and calling it Chateau Lafitte 1945. Uh, right. And get away with it. You can put a lot of, you can buy a lot of uh, Big Macs and, and shakes and large fries. <laughs> you can buy a couple of years worth. On yeah, the price totally. Of so, uh, so it's a very attractive product for mm -hmm. counterfeiting. And you can also, you can... You can do it at home. It's uh, you know it's a do-it-yourself project. If, if you need you need some good tools, but you're not going to make a Rolex at home. Uh, yeah, you probably make a, uh, um, a twenty-color uh, uh, Hermes scarf at home, but you can um, you can do it with wine. Right. Nice. Good point. And then, so what was kind of the uh, the cause for the the rise in in wine valuations in in the early two thousands? You know, you're asking the right question. What was it? And here's my thought. I'm a journalist. I'm not one of those people, so I can't speak first person, unfortunately. But let's say you made big killing, you know, on Wall Street or whatever it was, um, uh, Silicon Valley. So what do you do with your newfound money? Well, you might buy a nice house. You might buy a second uh, home, a condo in South Beach or wherever. Uh, you might buy one somewhere else. You're for sure going to buy a really sexy sports car. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll buy that Rolex. Uh, let's see. What else can you buy that you can use your surplus money to buy? Eventually, you're going to run out of things that are the basic things. Fancy car, fancy condo, uh, you know, custom-made clothes. There's only so many things only that, that you can buy and where you can park your surplus money and after a while you start to think well what else can i buy and then you suddenly are aware not so suddenly maybe but maybe you have friends who were involved with wine and there's this very strange world of upper end wine uh, connoisseurship connoisseurship in wine and mm -hmm. uh, why is that bottle of, of of 1945 lafitte or 1947 romani conti why is it worth so much and can it really be good after all the years have passed? Is it, you know, and your friends, they say, wow, you know, hey, Joe, you, you, you paid all that money for that, that, that old wine, you know, how do you know it's good? And why do you pay so much? And that makes you kind of culturally uh, somebody who's got a little extra, a, a little extra class because anybody who has the money can buy the Maserati or the Corvette or whatever, or the condo in South Beach. But you need to know a little something when you invest in older wine uh, from very complex areas like Burgundy and Bordeaux. Um, so it kind of gives you a little, uh, you become a class act when you buy the wine. Here's another thing about it. If you buy a great vintage of Bordeaux, let's say, uh, 19, 
1945 was a great vintage. 1961 was a great vintage in Bordeaux. 1990 was a great vintage in Bordeaux. Um, let's say you buy a couple of cases of 1990 Bordeaux. Uh, they're now uh, 30 years old. Um, mm -hmm. They are going up in value. Yeah. You know, your car might not be going up in value, your little Corvette, you know, uh, but but wine, if it's meant to be aged, and as long as it sits in a in a temperature controlled cellar, it's just mm -hmm. sitting there and it's it's gaining in value. Now, of course, the market goes up and down, but mostly the market has gone up because, you know, let's say again, you buy that 1990 uh, Chateau Latour, Chateau Lafitte, one of the great names. Romani Conti from Burgundy. It's not like a like a baby panda in the zoo where you can you know create it by artificial insemination. Uh, you know you 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 cannot make a wine one, original wine once the vintage has come. You have X thousand bottles or X hundred bottles, and then and they're gone. I mean, mm -hmm. that's it. Once they're drunk, you can't make any more unless you make it yourself. Uh, so, so in all sorts of ways, wine is an interesting thing to collect. Um, as as it is, as great vintages are consumed, the price has just got to go up, and and it almost always does. And if it goes down, if there's like a little blip in the market, it'll turn back up soon enough. It always has, and probably it always will. Yeah. So it's a great thing to uh, to you know. Somebody told me once, a friend who has a house out in East Hampton. He said, my accountant said to me, your house is the only thing you can buy and spend money on, uh, and you'll get it all back when you sell it. Well, it's true also of wine. Wow, okay. It just also the uh, kind of the idea of something being made, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago and then stored, and then now you're consuming it. It just seems like, it, it just seems so special and, and fun to have that, to know that it's been stored properly for so long and it was made, you know, so long ago, maybe before you were even born, you know? Um, it's true. And I have a book. It's right around here somewhere. I'm just reviewing it. It's called Burgundy, Vintage, Burgundy Vintages from 1845. And the two authors of this book, uh, or Burgundy obsessives uh, have literally tasted and have printed and put in their tasting notes going back to 1845. I looked up what happened in 1845. That's the year Texas entered the the Union uh, and became a state, uh, became a slave state. I'm afraid to say, uh, but here are two guys, uh, Alan Meadows and Doug Barzillay who have tasted wine made from grapes, which were on, which was on the vine in 1845. And guess what? They said it was good. Oh, okay. I mean, what else do we consume as, you know, food or liquid that you would, you would say was good if it was, you know, more than a century and a half old? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's only, only wine, you know? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's 150 years old, but you can try a bottle of wine. Um, yeah, totally. Well, and it's so cool how you can tie it in with the, you know, like you said, with the history going on at the moment, you know, whether it was, you know, some, they had shortages or issues around it being World War II or, you know, different things like that. It's, that's so cool to me. Yeah. And, and um, I'll tell you, I was once uh, lucky enough to be sitting on the um, patio of a famous champagne house uh, in, in champagne country. Uh, and there was a dinner served. It was a lovely dinner and we drank various champagnes with it. And the last champagne they brought out was a lot of ceremony. And they said, this, this is a champagne vintage 1914. And when the grapes for this champagne were being picked, we could hear the German cannons off in the distance as World War I started. Man. And they called it the, the, the vintage that was made by children and, and, and old, old people because all the men had gone to the front to, uh, to defend France against the German invasion. And so here was a champagne, which, you know, this idea that, wow, it was the grapes were picked 
at, at the very time they could hear these cannons and they didn't know if they were going to survive or if the Germans were really going to take over uh, a Pernay it was uh, the, the Champagne town where this was happening. And I really got, um, I got the shivers, you know, as I sipped that wine. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful, delicate wine. It had lost fruitiness and so on, but it kind of floated, floated ethereally in, in, in my mouth. It was just um, the essence of the grapes. They had lost their fruit. They'd lost their energy in a certain way. And yet there was something lovely there. And uh, as you say, the, you know, the history made it, gave it extra, extra depth, extra dimension. And, and I'll use a word the French are fond of using, extra emotion. Uh, you know, we're Americans, okay, so we weren't there. Um, but you could imagine the emotion you feel if you know that, that just, you know, no men were there anymore and, and war was happening, and yet the vintage had to go on. And mm -hmm. so and there's a lot of uh, history, as you say, that you've been attached to wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool that you got to experience that. Um, yeah, so let's jump back and let's talk about Rudy Kurniawan. Got it. There you go. There um, so where does how does Rudy begin? Where does he come from? Okay. Um, maybe let, let me just begin what where I began with Rudy Kurniawan. So okay. it, it's um, it's a it's a late on a Friday afternoon. The date is April 25th, 2008. Uh, I just been to the gym. I was all sweaty. Uh, I got a, the phone rang and it was a, a winemaker that I know. I'm sorry, a wine dealer I know and trust. And he said, uh, Peter, you should go down to the Acker, Maryland Condit auction. It starts at six o'clock at Crew. Uh, Crew Vine at that time probably had the greatest wine list of any restaurant in New York maybe 70,000 bottles altogether in its cellars. And I said, oh, why do I want to go down there? Because I always felt wine auctions are, frankly, they're boring. Um, they have to move very fast. It's not like art auctions where they can, you know, bring out a beautiful Picasso or an old master painting for you to see as it's being bid on. Mm -hmm. So I said, why, 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 what is it all about this auction? And this wine dealer, Jeffrey Troy, said, well, Apparently, they're going to withdraw 22 lots of a very sought-after Burgundian estate because the, the fourth-generation owner of that estate says these wines are fakes. So I didn't really want to take a shower and get dressed and go downtown, but I did, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, This was a time when the auction market was just going nuts. Uh, as I walked in about 15 minutes late, they were uh, the auction lot on the block was two bo bottles of champagne from the 1959 vintage, uh, Dom Perignon. They were estimated to sell for between five and eight thousand dollars. And as I came in, they were being the uh, the, the price hit eighty thousand dollars. Oh, so now why you would want? to pay $40,000 a bottle or, I mean, champagne, you know, okay. But it just, it just, you know, again, people with money, surplus money, they need to park somewhere. And the mm -hmm. story about the champagne was in the 1959 vintage uh, was entirely purchased of Dom Perignon 1959 for the um, 2000th anniversary of the uh, Iranian, uh, uh, royal families line um wow. and there was a huge party uh that the shah was having in uh in iran and uh he, this is the wine he wanted it was like a five-day party so he bought all what he thought was all the the uh, production of 1959 dom perignon in fact, you know, they're no dummies, those Burgundians. So they held back a little wine in a cellar. And two of those bottles were being auctioned. And, and, and But there's so little of it out there, apparently, that, that someone was willing to pay $80,000 for two bottles. So um, anyway, that's how the market was. I came in and uh, sure enough, midway in this auction, and they do go very fast, wine auctions. They, they need to because they got to sell a lot. Not like selling a 
fifty million dollar Picasso. You know, you can, there's no time to really go slow. So right. the auctioneer at the auction and said, um, "Well, folks, something a little unusual here. Um, at the request of the domain, it was called Domain Ponceau, and uh, with the agreement of the consigner, the one who." brought the wine to the auction. Rudy didn't say Rudy Kurniawan, but everybody knew it was Rudy. I'm withdrawing the next 22 lots of uh, Domaine Ponceau wines. At which point, some guy who was totally drunk out there said, fuck you, you know, <laughs> in a wine auction. But, and these, and these 22 lots, each lot is, you know, divides, it's, 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 a, it's a lot for sale. Uh, we're selling for up to $60,000 per case of these wines. So uh, why, what happened here? Uh, some collectors of Domaine Ponceau wines, very much sought after, had looked in the catalog for this auction, and they saw that amongst the wines were Domaine Ponceau Clendenie. This is one of the 32 greatest gross uh, of Burgundy, I'm sorry, uh, Close Saint Denis, 1945 through 1971 vintages. And these collectors, one of them was named Rockefeller, and that gives you an idea of how much money you have to have to buy this stuff, <laughs> said, gee, we've gone after it. We, you know, we're always looking for Domaine Ponceau. We'll buy any Ponceau, old Ponceau we can find. We've never heard of 1945 through 1971 vintages of Close Saint Denis, Domaine Ponceau. So one of them... Uh, called the fourth generation proprietor, Laurent Ponceau, in Burgundy, in the little town of Maurice Saint Denis. And they said, you know, these bottles here, I, I, we, we don't know if they could be real because we've never seen them. And mm -hmm. they photos from the, um, emailed them uh, uh, photos of the wines. Ponceau said, you know, I'm glad I was sitting down because I would have fallen off my chair, you know, when I looked at these photos. And he said, my father, never got access to Clos Saint Denis until 1982. So how could there be 1945 through 1971 vintages? Just couldn't be. So mm -hmm. it was really dramatic because this was a time when wine prices were going up. Everybody knew there were fakes out there in the market, especially with the best wines. But you could never be sure which ones were fake and which ones were not. I'll give you an example. In Bordeaux, there's Chateau Petrus. That's the most expensive Bordeaux. And on the on the label of Petrus is a little a little image of Saint Peter Petrus uh, holding a key in his hand. And people would look at the key on the label and they say, Ah, this key isn't quite right. This isn't the way it's really supposed to have been printed. We think this bottle is fake, but you didn't really know. Here mm -hmm. in the Domaine Ponceau wines, 1945 to 1971, was open and shut case. They could not exist because Laurent Ponceau's father did not get access until 1982. So this was really something remarkable. I didn't know it, but 10 minutes after I came in late to the auction, uh, an, an, another guy walked in late, and that was Laurent Ponceau. He had flown in from France, grabbed a taxi at JFK, went straight to the auction, and he came because he wanted to be sure that these bottles, which he knew were fake, uh, were not sold. The auctioneer wasn't too happy about not selling them because, you know, first of all, he got a big commission, and there were other reasons. Anyway, he did he did he did cancel that that sale, which is why this guy yelled, "Fuck you!" Um, there were a lot of people ready to buy that wine because they'd never seen it before. So it wasn't said, but everybody knew we. I knew that it was Rudy Kurniawan who had uh, consigned these bottles. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the auction, I asked the wine director uh, there at this restaurant crew, um, is, Rudy, is, Rudy, is Rudy Kurniawan here? He said, yeah, he's that little guy over in the corner. So I normally identify myself as a journalist. I'm not one of these undercover types. Um, I'm just not good at that. But this time I thought, okay, I'm going to let him think I'm a big time collector. And I walked over there. And there's Rudy in his beautiful custom tailored sport coat from Hermes, you know, open collar silk shirt, just looking great. And I said, hey, Rudy. 
And I see he looks at me like, hmm, where do I know this guy from? Of course, he doesn't know me because we've never seen each other. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, hey, Rudy, what happened with those uh, 22 lots of, of Domaine Ponceau wines? And he's looking at me and he's looking at me. And I see he's trying to think of an answer. Because at this moment, he knew something nobody else knew, which is that these wines had been made in his own kitchen. But finally, uh, and he knew he was in trouble. He knew there was trouble coming because uh, nobody yet knew. At, at that time, people, Rudy was the biggest wine dealer in the world. Um, hey, Travis, do you collect uh, frequent flyer miles? Yeah, sure. Okay, so Rudy had 27 million on his American Express card at this time. <laughs> 27 million, you know, which he got basically by buying a million dollars or more worth of wine every month for quite a few years he'd been doing that. I mean, he, could buy, he, could buy, he could buy a million dollars in a day, bought them from domestic dealers, bought them from French dealers, English dealers. He had, he had his claws out all over the world to, to buy wine. And he bought a lot of real wine. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you know, when I ask him this question, you know, Rudy, what happened with those 22 lots of Domaine Ponceau? I see he's thinking, what is he, what to say? And finally he says, well, we try our best, but it's Burgundy and shit happens. And that's the only thing he ever said about those wines. I ran off into a cor another corner of the auction of the restaurant and I wrote those words down in my uh, in my catalog, you know, we, mm -hmm. you know, try our best, it's Burgundy, but shit happens. And they're still there in that catalog from from 20, 2008. And that's the last thing he really ever said. Um, he never talked to another journalist about it. I was just not to be there at the right moment and just, you know, did so uh, the next day. I called my editor at Wine Spectator magazine, where I wrote uh, as a freelance, and I said, uh, hey, Mitch, um, I went to an interesting auction last night, and they withdrew these 22 lots of Domaine Ponceau wines, and the guy who consigned them, Rudy Cornelwine, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And Mitch said, oh, that's interesting, Mitch Frank. Uh, go do a story about that. So I wrote mm -hmm. it. And... Um, I, I occasionally wrote for Wine Spectator. I was, as I say, a freelance. And the day after that story came out, uh, I got called into Wine Spectator. The proprietor, uh, Marvin Schenken, wanted to see me. It turned out that they got more hits on that story than probably any story they'd ever done. Because there was just, the air was alive with, you know, what's going on with wine counterfeiting. And finally, here was a, example of really top-end wine counterfeiting that we, nobody knew who did it yet but it was just known these bottles were not could not exist as they, as were stated uh, so i tried to get in contact with it was difficult i did finally he did finally call me back and uh he told me how much he loved wine he's really trying to figure out where he got the wine um the auctioneer, John Capon, said to me, well, you know, Rudy's the biggest wine in the, world, in the world, and he doesn't keep good records, so, you know, you, you've got to understand, he may not remember or can't, might not be able to figure out where he got those bottles, who sold those bad bottles to him. So give him mm -hmm. time, give him time, and, and, and so on. And, 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 uh, and Rudy said to me when he called me finally, he said, well, I'm still working on it, but, you know, I love Old Burgundy so much, he compared the color of old burgundy which gets kind of a tawny color to the uh, the color of the veins in an old lady's arms um huh what <laughs> but i sort of <laughs> i mean he's good rudy was good you know and, right. and he did love Burgundy. and here's another thing about him he he you ask about his background so he came here to the u.s on a um on a student visa he uh, he went to Cal State Northridge, that far from where you are now, a little far, yeah, um, a bit, but not, yeah, uh, yeah. So he got an accounting degree, um, did well in school, 
after school, he didn't go back to Indonesia. He kind of, ah, he's worked in a golf pro shop, at a golf course. <laughs> what? One day the owner came in and said, hey, Rudy, on your last shift, a very expensive driver, Japanese-made driver, disappeared. Do you know what happened to that? Rudy said, I don't know. And Jeez. when he walked out, he never came back again. So um, he still has that <laughs> closet. I don't know. Um, he, he also lied about himself. He said he went to, to Cal State Northridge on a, on a golf scholarship. That wasn't true. But there mm-hmm. are a lot of things that weren't. Most everything wasn't true. What was true was that Rudy, well, here's the story. Supposedly in about the year 2000, his father came over from Indonesia. They had a birthday dinner for him uh, at a restaurant on Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Interestingly, Mm -hmm. who could remember every wine he ever tasted, couldn't remember what restaurant it was. And Rudy ordered the most expensive wine on the wine list which is called uh, Opus One, you know, a kind of a cult Cabernet from California, Napa Valley. And it, he just flipped out. He loved it. It was like the big epiphany. And the next day, he started to look around L.A. for every bottle of Opus One he could find, each bottle costing a couple hundred dollars. And, uh, and he opened them. He tasted them. And he tasted them night, tasted them day. He tasted them all the time. And... One cold Cabernet led to another, and he he, he just uh, he just got fascinated with wine, and he would go to tasting groups, and very soon he began to bring very expensive bottles to open at these tasting groups. So mm-hmm. guess what? In really expensive bottles, you get invited again, <laughs> right? And, and the more expensive they are, the wealthier they are, the people who are uh, who are members of these tasting groups. And Rudy, who had really been just drifting, suddenly found himself with very, very wealthy men, mostly men, uh, who who befriended him because Rudy brought the great bottles. And where he got the money to do this is another issue. It's not very, uh, it's not very pleasant. Uh, but but he, he had the money and he had the palate. He had the taste he had he had the tasting chops to really distinguish between wines. This was absolutely the truth in the story of a guy who was a con man. He could remember every wine he tasted. He could blind taste. There was uh, he began to have tastings at restaurants, never at his home, which mm-hmm. was an art. Yeah. And uh, there would be blind tastings at which they would put twelve bottle twelve glasses out, and, and wines would be poured. And Rudy would always uh, identify 10 out of 12. And there was one other taster, a guy, a wealthy guy, who was watching all this, the same tastings. He said, I don't know how he's doing it, but he's cheating. So maybe, maybe he's giving a thousand bucks to somebody in the kitchen and they're writing the names of the, of the wines on the, underneath the napkin or something. Something is happening. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm going to fix Rudy. I'm going to have a tasting at my house. I'm going to control everything everything and there's no way he's going to know which the wines are so he invited rudy and a couple other people to this tasting and put out 12 glasses and the wines had been already poured blind there was no way rudy could know what they were guess what uh-huh. he got out of 12 again 10 he identified 10 out of 12 Man. so so he just had you know travis it's the people who have perfect pitch in music uh, he had perfect pitch for wine. He just knew. Uh, mm-hmm. So there was a great wine uh, educator in France who once said, when it comes to wine, it's like if you have a group of people in a drinking wine in a cocktail room somewhere, and you send somebody to the next room with a crystal wine glass, and you have them tap the glass with a silver spoon, and it goes ping. The people back in the other room who don't have that good a sense will say, ah, I heard a noise. What was that? People who one level up who have a better sense of what they hear will say, oh, that was, um, I think someone tapped a crystal wine glass with, with a spoon. The third level up, somebody said, yeah, that's what it was. And the note was E flat. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. Rudy knew an E flat in wine. Uh, 
He just did. I mean, it was nothing that, I mean, yes, he, he educated himself, but he had the basic tools and, and many people learn to um, distrust Rudy about the bottles he was selling, but everybody agreed he just had a great palate for wine and could really, really distinguish between wines. Mm -hmm. So I'm Man, so it, hot here, so you can <laughs> break in here. Real no, this is great. This is the uh, the lazy man's interview. You're doing great, Pete. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, I mean, it kind of initially sounds like he was always sort of a, you know, con man or looking to kind of, he, he was never like, fully telling the truth with, you know, working at that golf shop and probably stealing that golf club and everything. But then it sounds like he kind of organically found wine, something that he probably just loved at first and realized he had this great palate and sense for it. And then just kind of started to recognize the opportunity that was there to, to start counterfeiting. Well, yes. And just to put a finer point on it up until about, I would say, well, 2001, 2002, you could still find out in the marketplace rare wines going back not just 20 years, but 30, 40, 50 years. They were there and they were expensive, but they could be found, especially in English and French uh, dealers who specialized in that. But at a certain point, they all got drunk. There just was no more. And I think this is accurate statement. At some point, Rudy said to himself, I know how these wines should taste. I know how the 1947 uh, Romani Conti from Burgundy, or I know how the 1945 Mouton Rothschild from Bordeaux, I know how they should taste. And I think maybe I could just make them because he had no respect for fakes that were obviously fake. He, mm -hmm. he, he wanted the wines to taste the way the real wines taste. So here's what basically he bought old commercial grade wines from France. If you, you know, if you go into a Burgundian cellar, they're big, vast cellars often. And if the vintage is not great, they'll, they'll just shove the bottles back in a corner, like a mountain of bottles. And, and sometimes they just, they forget about them. They just get cobwebs on them. And, and at some point someone says, Oh, we got the, um, the 19, you know, 1938 vintage of, of domain so-and-so here, you know, gosh, here's, here's, here's 200 bottles. Um, what are we going to do with them? Well, they emailed Rudy and said, would you like to buy 200 bottles of the 1935, whatever, 1933, whatever. And, uh, and, and they would email him this query and he would email back, um, are the bottles hand blown or are they machine molded? You only wanted hand blown bottles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how deep is the punt? That's the, the area un in the, underneath the bottle so that the sediment falls along the top of the kind of the little mountain peak at the bottle. Um, right. Very important for him was, was there a crust on the neck of the bottle? Uh, when you lay a bottle flat, like in storage, after about 10 years and not before, a crust begins to form, a hard crust on the neck of the bottle. And it's not like the sediment in the bottom that you can kind of shake up and it's just there. This is a hard crust, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of years for that to get there. He wanted that crust. And if everything was okay in his mind, he would buy the bottles. He never quibbled about price. He just paid the price. Mm -hmm. Those bottles in his um, at his home in Arcadia, and then he would, let's say it was a Pinot Noir, that's 100% Burgundy is 100% Pinot Noir, red Burgundy. He mm -hmm. would uh, pour out half the bottle, carefully remove the cork so he could reinsert it. Uh, he would add in, let's say, half a bottle or a third of a bottle of good quality California Pinot Noir, possibly Oregon Pinot Noir, the same grape. And he would kind of mix and match, mix and match until he got the taste he wanted. And if you open that bottle, you would say, wow, this, this wine has that funk of old Burgundy, but it also has this beautiful, youthful fruit underneath. It's amazing. It's 75 years old. It's still got youth to it. Well, of course, the youth was the California wine and, right. and the funk 
old wine, and he would get their proportions right. And he fooled a lot of people this way, and he could sell that wine for a lot of money uh, because, as I say, it didn't exist anymore, frankly, in the marketplace. Maybe a bottle here, a bottle there, but mostly these older wines that were desirable were gone, and Rudy was able to... Um, uh, he was able to create them in a way that, that people would pull the cork and they would say, yeah, this is the real thing. He was great at it. Yeah, crazy. And so when he was, when he was doing this, he would kind of, you know, he would get these old bottles and then would he just, um, you know, maybe change the year on it or would he, you know, say it's a completely different wine or what were kind of like his methods of, of doing that stuff? Well, that's a good question. He had various methods. Um, he he would do what I mentioned before. He certainly drank a lot of real wine. Um, it's interesting. When he would blow into New York from California, talking about 2005, 2006, 2007, he would invite a crew to this uh, restaurant. Uh, uh, well, it's called Crew. Um, his wine drinking buddies, and he would order bottles off the wine list uh, at extraordinary cost. Um, I was able to look at his American Express bills. Uh, there was one period in 2006 when, when over four days in New York, um, his bills came to $85,000 at crew uh, the restaurant. And most of that was food, not, I mean, wine, not food. Uh, yeah. And, and, but then he did something interesting. He would say to, to the wine director of the restaurant crew, uh, by the way, that restaurant was down on Lower Fifth Avenue near Washington Square. Uh, wasn't a very fancy looking restaurant, but the owner was a big Wall Streeter who had a huge cellar and he basically made his own personal wine cellar the uh, the wine list of the restaurant um, and and um, at the end of one of these long meals when Rudy spent maybe twenty thousand thirty thousand bucks on wine off the wine list he would say to the wine director um, I, I I'm I, I'm keeping these very good wine bottles uh, for a video I'm doing a kind of a wine museum so I want you to FedEx those empty bottles back to me with their corks back to my house in Arcadia, California. And the wine director basically said, hey, you know, you spend these, you know, more than $10,000 on wine tonight, you get what you want. I'll fed out right. and I'll people pack it up in the morning and we'll FedEx the bottles back to you. So this was done about 17 times. Cases of empty bottles were sent back to him. And of course, while he had paid a great deal of money for each bottle, um, he would then recycle them in the truly recycle them and, you know, fill them with something else, one of his mixtures. And so if you bought that bottle from Rudy of 1945 Mouton Rothschild, it was a real bottle with a real label, with a real cork. Mm -hmm. Just the wine wasn't real anymore. Right. But, you know, there was no point trying to, it's what we went going back to what we talked about before, you 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 can learn in a minute if the Rolex is fake, but you could not really learn if that wine was fake until you pulled the cork. And by then it was kind of too late. Um, mm -hmm. But in addition, he was a, he learned to be a very careful, uh, what shall I say, uh, craftsman in making new bottles. Um, he had a First, he started to print labels on a high-quality laser printer. Then he understood, okay, the real labels are not printed on laser printers. They're printed in, on offset, you know, in a, in a, in a real printery. Right. So through one of his brothers, he arranged to have labels printed, apparently, at the finest printer in commercial printer. So the labels got better and better, and they, they just were... There was no way you couldn't know they were real. In fact, found in his house were labels just on these kind of peeled off sheets, you know, 10 labels per sheet. Well, there's no way at home you can create print labels on a peel off sheet like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you, but it's done. It's a commercial job. Um, so uh, 
he he was very careful and he learned more and more about how to make better and better bottles better and better meaning bottles that were more and more difficult to to catch as counterfeits yeah a lot of people he really really did and here's another thing about it and we going back to what we talked about if you if if someone invites you to dinner and it's time to open some very expensive bottles and your host is very proud of the bottle that you're about to open, you know, a multi-thousand dollar bottle, and he pours it and he's really feeling like, hey, you know, you're on my A-list and you're getting to drink this wine. Are you going to tell him uh, this tastes fake? You're not going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't want to be that jerk. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you just don't want to spoil the party. So you convince yourself that that it's real, or if you don't convince yourself, you tend not to say anything because it's just it's the height of discourtesy to tell someone that the wine they are so proud of doesn't taste right to you. So it kind of preserves uh, the, the fakeness of the wine, the counterfeitedness. Um, it, it's it's an interesting business, and also <laughs> people. Once they've had warmed up with some champagne and uh, then they have some white wine and finally get some red wine, at a certain point, they're not able anymore to really know the difference between the wine they're drinking and, and Coca-Cola. Uh, right. Just, uh, you know, these big bouts of drinking, uh, it, it becomes very difficult. So so anyway, Rudy, he was helped by by the nature of wine in doing what he did and by his own skills in doing it. And he had really great skill in this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, I was telling, I was, when I was reading your book, I was telling one of my friends about how he would, you know, mix these wines together to make them, you know, taste pretty good and taste, you know, fool most people on the, on the taste. And he was like, it'd be great if we could just, you know, like I would love to buy a bottle that I knew was fake, but was like modeled after, you know, one of these multi-thousand dollar bottles. Like, he, like, it's like, that would be so fun to try one of those, even though, you know, it, it was like marketed as a fake or like a, a duplicate of it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Travis, if if Rudy, with all his skills at at uh, at creating these, these fakes, kind of mix, mixing and matching, as I say, if he had just said to people, you see this bottle? This looks like Lafitte 1945. It looks perfect in every way. And it's going to taste like 1945 Lafitte. Is, but I made it. He never. He would not be in, in, in federal prison now if he had just said that to people. You know, right. if, you, if you if you um, if you paint a, a, a Renoir and you're a good painter or, or a Van Gogh, whatever it is, you know, a top, you know, painter. And you reproduce a perfect example, and you sign the painter's name. If you sell that to somebody, as long as you tell them, actually, I painted this, even though it looks like the real thing, you're you're not, you're you're okay. You know, you just have to reveal the truth. The truth, right. um, the truth, will make you free. And mm -hmm. you know, had Rudy ever done, um, I also would have bought bottles from him just to see, you know, what he'd made. And uh, but but he didn't tell people that. And and, um, you know, it's interesting uh, how he got caught. You want to talk about that a little bit? Or... Yeah, let's do it. OK, so he was on top of the world in 19 in 2006. He sold thirty five million dollars worth of wine at two auctions. Uh, two auctions held by Hacker Marilyn Condit, which is a New York wine auctioneer. Mm -hmm. All the bottles came from him and seemed like he was just on top of the world of wine. He really was. He was still quite young in his early, let's see, he would have, was he even 30 yet? Maybe not even quite. And um, he gave a guarantee on those wines. And the auctioneer, John Capon, said, you know, Rudy, he's doing something nobody else has been willing to do. If you don't want the wine, if you don't like the wine, he'll take it back and he'll give you your money back. 
And actually, as it turned out, quite a few people decided that the wine that they had bought for very high prices, there were, that there were problems with it. Yeah. And uh, they returned to the auctioneer. The auctioneer had to give the money back, and then the auctioneer had to get it back, get it back from Rudy, which wasn't so easy as it turned out. Right. Um, but uh, it was understood that Rudy was was problematic as a wine dealer at a certain point. Um, he made the one big mistake, uh, which was to uh, sell some wine to Bill Koch, one of the Koch brothers. Bill Koch doesn't like to be um, flim-flammed. And when he realized that some wines that he had bought through auction from, from Rudy were fake, he decided to find out all he could about Rudy Cornea wine. He sent ex FBI agents, ex FBI agents, CIA operatives, uh, national security agency operatives, uh, Jeez. I five operatives from England, all over Asia to find out what they could about Rudy. Rudy, for example, said, "Well, he was from a wealthy Indonesian family, so he went to a high school in Singapore, where wealthy Indonesians like to send their children." Bill Koch sent agents there and and got them to open the records, and Rudy never went to this high school. <laughs> Rudy said, uh, my family had the um, Heineken beer uh, uh, license for Indonesia and other parts of Asia and China. Um, Bill Koch sent people to all these places to ask, you know, does the Kurnia one family have have uh, the exclus exclusivity to to Heineken? And they never heard of the family. So all the things that Rudy claimed about his family that there was a big estate uh, in Jakarta, nothing nothing panned out. So this information was passed on to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York because Bill Cope was hoping there would be a prosecution. Of Rudy, and mm -hmm. basically the the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern Southern District of New York, Preet Bharara, at the time said, "Nah, we we don't we don't. Um, I can't use my resources for this. You know, I have uh, terrorism cases. I have big time drug lords that I have to deal with. I have Wall Street shenanigans. And you know what? If if some rich guys." want to buy this wine for so much money and they can't figure out whether it's real or fake, that's not going to be the government's problem. I'm not spending taxpayer money on this kind of investigation. But right. one young assistant U.S. attorney named Jason Hernandez, who loves wine, but loves it seriously uh, as a collector, and he wanted to pursue this case against Rudy Kurniawan. And basically, he just kept pushing to do this until Preparar agreed that he could go forward. And he combined with a crusty old uh, veteran FBI agent named Jim Wynn, who was an art fraud expert. So he knew nothing about wine, but Jason Hernandez knew everything about wine or enough. And between the two of them, they started to work on this case. And um, and little by little, they built up a case against Rudy Kurniawan until they were pretty sure they had him not simply as someone who was buying fake wine and passing it on, uh, but that he was making it. And how did they come to this conclusion? Well, I'll just tell you one little tidbit. They're looking through his uh, credit card records and they see, see that and his emails and they see that Rudy was looking to buy French wax, burgundy colored wax, the kind, mm -hmm. you know, the king stamped a seal on a document, you know, and the wax and it dried. That's hard to find that kind of wax. But Rudy found two sources in, in the U.S. who had this kind of French wax. He would say, I want wax that's, uh, that's brittle, not the kind that's soft. And if you've ever tried to pry a, a wax uh, capsule off a bottle, uh, uh, you know, it, it cracks into a, like a hundred little pieces. It's a pain. It's a big pain in the ass. Um, OK. Wanted. So these two guys, Jason Hernandez and the and the agent, Jim Wynn, discovered that in one year, Rudy had spent fourteen hundred dollars 
on French wax, uh, suitable for recapping bottles. Right. Um, you know, okay, you know, all right, you need certain supplies, but you need $1,400 worth of uh, French wax. And <laughs> the obvious conclusion, he must be doing something with it that has to do with dipping bottles, uh, the neck of bottles into, uh, into wax. And many, they began to find things like that. And just to cut to the end of this story, um, they eventually got a, 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 an arrest warrant for Rudy. Uh, they weren't sure if he was home. This is, we're now on March, uh, March 12th, 2012, March 8th, 2012. So at 6 p.m. one night, um, there's a knock on Rudy's door in Arcadia. He answers it and they say, ah, oh, I'm a neighbor. I'm looking for a lost dog. My dog got ran away. Have you seen the dog? Where he says, no, I haven't seen a dog, and he shuts the door. So the agents knew that he was home. Next morning, nice. a.m., came the big knock, you know. FBI, open the door. Um, in fact, I don't, know, I don't know if you can see this, but um, this was the cover of the wine spec. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, nice. It's the story. FBI, open the door. Um, and uh, the FBI agents... He came out in his silk, uh, silk pajamas, Hermes pajamas, and he was handcuffed on the spot. Uh, his mother was in the house. The, she had to come out. She wasn't handcuffed. And that was it. Rudy was arrested. Um, and he remains uh, in a federal prison prisoner to this day. Uh, he will finally be um, released from prison on uh uh, in November of this year, he had a 10-year sentence. Um, I'll tell you one more thing about that that's curious, and I can't answer the, this question. Uh -huh. Most federal uh, defendants who are accused of crime in federal court, they plead out. They do a plea deal, and in return, plead guilty, they a, a lesser sentence. He did not plead guilty. He pleaded not guilty. Forced the government to go through a trial, which is expensive. Um, you know, in his house, the FBI found 18,000 fake labels for wine. Found a whole counterfeiting workshop. Uh, in, the, in, in the kitchen, in the sink, there were bottles, you know, empty. There were all kinds of mechanisms for recorking bottles. Whatever it took to make fake wine. He, he had the materials and, and it was clear he was doing it. So nobody, I don't know why he chose to plead not guilty because it was very clear that he was going to be convicted. But that's mm -hmm. what he, and the result, instead of getting what might have been as little as a couple of years sentence, he got a 10-year sentence. And, um, and so he will, uh, he will be released uh, in November You'll get to be a free man for about two steps as he walks out the jailhouse door. And then the ICE agents will each grab an arm and they will escort him to the, uh, the first uh, flight back to Jakarta because wow. he, uh, he was here on a, uh, on a long voided uh, student visa. So mm -hmm. he already told to leave the country. He didn't do it uh, when he was still free. And, and so... That's the end of Rudy Kurniawan's career in in United States. What he'll yeah. do in back in Indonesia will be interesting to see. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah, I didn't realize he was so close to being uh, released again. It's coming up quick. Yeah. Um, I, I tried to visit him in a previous. He's now in Pecos, Texas, but when he was still in in California, um, Taft, California. Have you ever been to Taft, California? I don't know anybody who's been to Taft, California. Yeah, I don't. A little town sounds familiar, up, but I've never been there. An oil country. It's it's uh, orange groves and oil, and I've never found anybody except myself who's been to Taft. And the only reason I've been to Taft was to see if I could talk to Rudy, but I, I wasn't able to. But um, they closed that prison down, and now he's in Pecos, Texas. Um, okay. And I think he's been a model prisoner. And uh, and so he'll serve slightly less time than ten years. But it's a long time, 
and um, and he remains the only person who has been prosecuted in the federal war wine counterfeiting. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. He he's the only one who's been prosecuted. But I mean, what like wine counterfeiting was even before him, it was pretty widespread and known about even, right? Yes. Yes. It got more so, you know, in the two thousands when the wine went prices just went crazy in it. And guess uh-huh. what? It's it's the wine prices are still crazy and there's a whole new wave of shadowy counterfeiters out there who are you know, the, the, using new methods to to counterfeit wine, and meanwhile, the the more expensive uh, winemakers, wineries, have developed a whole raft of techniques to make their bottles more difficult to to counterfeit. But the counterfeiters are matching them. I mean, you can look at certain bottles with a with a black light, and you know, certain parts of the label will light up. Uh, some winemakers are putting certain chemical additives in the ink, and they have special sensors. If you put it on the bottle, it will sense that chemical so that you know it's a real bottle. Uh, there's a, 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 an expert on wine counterfeiting named Maureen Downey. Most of this world is men, but Maureen is definitely not a man. Um, she has developed a kind of a blockchain technology so that you can trace the bottle from the time it leaves the winery, each place it goes. Um, and she uses a proof tag on the, on the capsule. So you put your camera up against the proof tag and it takes a picture and this picture goes back to some archive where it, it determines whether that wine is actually real. real. Um, oh, that's cool. It's very cool. And it's happening more. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, it's a cat and mouse game between the counterfeiters and the really serious wineries that care about whether their wine is counterfeited or not. And yeah. some don't care. Some don't care. They say if you want to, if you want to, somebody wants to spend ten thousand dollars on a bottle, you know, of old wine, supposedly from my, you know, good for them, you know, right. the real. I don't. You know, just just makes just my wine up, you know, better known. So um, uh, yeah, geez, buyer beware, I guess. Yes, and most wineries do care and are taking those steps. Uh, So yeah, yeah. well, good. No, because I that's what I I was curious how the um, you know, if the vintage wine market had changed and if Rudy had kind of changed it, you know, and made counterfeiting more in the public eye, but it sounds like it hasn't really uh, knocked it off too much. Well, as I say, it's cat and mouse, and and you can look at certain labels. Uh, even if you look at them, it doesn't help. There, another technique now that's used in in, um, in labeling wines is microprinting. So, for example, there's a very famous wine from Pomerol in the right bank of, of Bordeaux, um, that 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 uh, label actually is on the capsule. If you look, if you looked under ultra magnification, you would see the names of the owner's children uh, has been printed in in micro print to wow. too small eye to see. Um, couldn't you? They used to not be able to do this, but now it can. Be, there are technologies for that. Uh, if you look at a Lafitte label, it's kind of a um, there's some you see the chateau in the background the foreground there's some harvesters young women harvesting wine Uh, if you look very close at the harvesting there are certain things you could see in micro print which would tell you this is the real label Uh, most counterfeiters they wouldn't be able to duplicate that level of technology yeah Um, right so yeah, well, you know the ultimate. You want, you want to know what the ultimate uh, kind of anti-counterfeiting gesture is? Anne Colgan, who has a had a very famous winery, Colgan Winery. It's what again? What's called a uh, Colt Cabernet Sauvignon sells for many hundreds of dollars. Um, she would take the bottle and with her lipstick and kiss it, give it a good, good. A real good, like almost a French kiss, uh-huh. and that would put 
DNA on the bottle, on her inner lipstick uh, oh. smear. That's on. And so if someone really wanted to know if this was a real bottle of Colgan, uh, they could have the, uh, the lipstick print analyzed to see if it really was um, Ann Colgan's DNA. So <laughs> that kind of, <laughs> Man. on Valentine, especially, right? That makes uh, that seems like the right thing to do. So, right. Yeah. It's um, it's it's all cat and mouse. I keep saying it. Um, the, the 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 winemakers get more sophisticated, and so do the counterfeiters. Mm -hmm. Totally. Man, well, this was awesome. Thanks for sharing that story, Pete. It was so fun to read your book and go through this and then hear it from you again. It's 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 really cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. And by the way, this is the book, a little a little um, self-serving, but um, I guess you can see it here. Oh, yeah, that's the paperback. Thank you. Yep. Um, it's, it's been a nice experience. And um, uh, yeah, with a little luck, we do have a... a um, movie tv option out there and it's a long way from the option to the <laughs> to any reality so i'm not holding my breath but uh maybe someday we will see um yeah this uh, seems like great for hollywood to pick up seems like such a good movie it would be i could i could definitely see that okay we'll put you in the movie if it ever happens <laughs> we'll have we'll have rudy up uh, you know, trick you, you know, right. you, you can play, play the part of a, of a billionaire, uh, wine guy, you know, right. Yeah. Enthusiast. I'll tell you, he could have fooled me for sure. I, I know he could have, uh, mm -hmm. he was, he's a great con man. He's likable. He's warm. He's generous. And somehow along the way you lose the money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he just got like crazy, greedy too it seems like and just spending over the top on you know his suits and everything too you know oh yes he did do that and that's a kind of a sordid and sad story which uh it's in the book but he did uh control of what he was doing at some you know bought a multi-million dollar house uh, uh in beverly hills and so on and uh which he he, he really he had a big garage, just for example, and and he turned he was turning the garage into a um, champagne uh, climate controlled champagne cellar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he just had all sorts of big plans, but in the end, uh, he couldn't keep it up. He just couldn't he couldn't maintain the dishonesty. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It seems like he really cared about his image and and kind of sh showing off how much wealth he had. Definitely too. He did do that, and uh, all for not, though. Yep. Okay, cool. And then, so, uh, where's the best place for people to pick up your book? Just on Amazon? I, You know, I love bookstores, independent bookstores, but I'm yeah. afraid if you go yeah. to an independent bookstore, you probably won't find it. Uh, I did find it at my local Barnes & Noble. But, yeah, just push that button on Amazon. It's, we all do it, even though we somehow feel, you know, we want to support our local businesses, but sometimes you just... You just push that button, you know, to buy it. Mm -hmm. So, sure, it's it's there. Okay, there was, maybe you might know of it. I heard of a um, another author talked about a. It's similar to Amazon, but they'll like uh, you can find a book and it'll tell you the nearest bookstore that has it from you. It's like called Indie that. Book or something like that. Same. Yeah. Okay. I'll 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 look it up again. I get the get the okay. name on that and see if I can find yours on there. You know. I think most of us would, in a minute, go to a real bookstore uh, if if we could and find what we want. But you know, it's like everything else; you can whatever you want. It's there on Amazon in multiple uh, possibilities, so it's just mm -hmm. so easy. So um, yeah, anyway, totally. The yeah. love hate of Amazon. Yeah, it sure is. It's tough. We have a. We're like so lucky. We have a a local. Um, like video rental store here still that's just hanging on independent it's not a blockbuster or anything but just right two blocks away from us so we always make sure to go walk there and and rent from them rather than just rent on you know apple tv or something wow that's great well uh, i wish we did they're, they're all gone all those stores here yeah. in the upper side where i where i live so uh 
So you get DVDs from them, or um, what do you mm -hmm. rent? Yeah, DVDs? they have DVDs and Blu-rays to rent. Yeah, just like your typical store. But it's it's so such a nice experience to go in there and just walk around and browse. And all the people that work there know so much about movies too. So it's it's great. I, I wish more of them were around still. Yeah, and that's you know the parallel to that are bookstores where you go in and you ask and you get informed information about books and uh, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd rather buy that way. We luckily have a few stores like that left in New York. One, the biggest one is the Strand, which is downtown on Broadway at 12th Street. And that's a store with about a trillion books. And, Ooh. you know, they're, you go and you ask, where's, do you have a certain book? And they'll tell you where to find it. You know, it's, it's just amazing. So, um, yeah, yep. including one. <laughs> so, totally. Kenny, thanks, cool. for, it, for um, Yeah. This was fun to do. Of course. Yeah, thank you. It was great having you on. Thanks for sharing the story. And uh, for everyone listening, I'll have the link for people to check out your book and, and pick up their own copy. But uh, yeah, thanks again, Pete. Really appreciate it. All my pleasure, Travis. Hope to, hope to do something with you again for the next book, if there is one. <laughs> yes, yeah, sounds good. Or we'll see you on the, uh, the premiere for the movie. Hey, there you go. Red carpet, here we come. <laughs> right on. Cool. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, Pete. Have a good one, all right? Same to you. Bye. Right. Bye-bye.